Hello and welcome to another episode of Chasing Excellence. My name is Patrick Cummings and as always I am here with Ben Bergeron. Every week on the show we dedicate some time to exploring how we can live a life of better health and increased fulfillment. We answer your questions about the five factors of health, dive deep on living a life of excellence and explore the strategies and frameworks to help us chase what truly matters. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. Thank you, Patrick. Good, good, good. We are we are into the summer here. Um, we've got this episode. We've got listener questions about wall walks, charting your own path in life, feeding kids, and athletes who no rep themselves uh, to the top of the leaderboard. Our workout's going to be a conversation about how to focus on the five factors when life gets in the way. And we will wrap up with a recap of your top 10 CrossFit Games memories uh, as we are getting closer to your final <laughs> CrossFit mm. Games. So we thought it was appropriate to maybe revisit the past. Uh, so we'll wrap up the episode with that. But first, our warm-up. We start each episode with your questions about the five factors of health, those few fundamental behaviors that most positively affect our performance, vitality, and longevity. Those five factors are how we eat, how we move, how we think, how we connect, and how we recover. Ready? Let's do it. All right. First question in our move category is from James. I hate <laughs> – this is a bit of a diatribe. I hate wall walks, and I'm not sure they are being utilized properly in CrossFit. I'm six, uh, six foot, 220 pounds, 43-year-old CrossFit, uh, CrossFit athlete. been doing CrossFit for about 10 years with my level one cert. On the CrossFit website, it says that wall walks are to introduce the basics of inversion. The athlete remains supported by three points of contact. That sounds like an excellent way for somebody to get used to going upside down. Over the last few years, wall walks have become a mainstay in most CrossFit programming that I have seen. Are wall walks, as they are used today, the best option? If you're trying to build shoulder strength, aren't there better options like push press, strict press, handstand push-ups? Is the midline stability challenge of a wall walk the best part of the movement? In my opinion, all they do is restrict a person's breathing, and that is what makes them challenging. Does the movement tax your shoulders? Yes. Is it a benefit to midline stability? Uh, yes. But can all of these things be achieved with other movements? I say yes. So can we can we strike wall walks from the record for James? You know, if James had asked me that when they first came out, I probably would have said yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, because I was in the same boat. I was like, this is a progression. We're using, like, we don't do snatch, we don't do snatch balances in competition. Snatch balance is a, is a, is a skill transfer movement. Mm -hmm. Like this is, as James says, this is a skill transfer. This is a, a way to get athletes to get inverted. Um, but they do a lot. They do a lot more than that. Mm. And James lists them. He does them well. And because um, something can be accomplished with another movement, doesn't strike it off the list of being a viable movement. Like, can you get? Um, can you get leg strength and development through lunges? Yes. Does that mean we shouldn't do squats? Mm -hmm. No. Like they're two different things. They're two different movements. And it's the same type of thing. Like there's different. Um, aspects of the shoulder and the midline stabilization that are being challenged in different ways than a wall walk um, than it would be in a handstand push up certainly different than a uh, press or push press yep. I, I don't know if I want to go on record saying this but right now I actually think wall walks are more functional mm. than a handstand push up mm. You're really upsetting James right now. He yeah. might stop listening to the show. So now. like, I can't remember what it was, but I was actually in something s recently and I can't remember if I was like, uh, in a boat or something like that. And I had my hand, I was on all fours and I needed to get my legs up onto like something else. And I essentially did a wall walk to get there. So where were you that this was a I, requirement? I, not a wall, like, but like put my hand from an all fours position and I need to get my legs up onto something like onto a bench or something. Okay. That's why I wish I were specific. The story would, be, story would be a whole lot better. And James would buy into this a lot more if I had a true You need thing. to remember why you were doing yeah. this. Um, but I actually like the the walk the walking aspect of that uh, unilateral loading of the shoulder and what it does through the midline. Um God, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I, I, I'm I'm not opposed to wall walks right now. Yeah, right. and I think we did a conversation about wall walks way back when, and I was like, they suck. I don't remember that. But so, I actually like this saying as well. It's just my like in terms of me changing my mind on this. Mm -hmm. I came across this recently, which is this saying that my tailor 
is the only person I know that acts sensibly because my tailor takes my measurements anew every time I see him. Mm -hmm. He doesn't assume I'm the same person as the last time we saw each other. He assumes I've changed. Mm -hmm. And I kind of, I like that a lot. Like, you know, a while back I probably was against wall walks and now I'm for them. That doesn't mean anything. We should change. We should evolve and we should take new data points. So today, James, I'm not with you. I think James' issue that he's six foot and 220 pounds exactly and right. wall walks suck when you're six. Yeah. So James, <laughs> I don't want to do deadlifts. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question from Kat in our thing category. My dream in life is to open my own CrossFit gym. I know I can be a successful entrepreneur and I have a lot of faith in myself and my work ethic. My parents are not supportive of this dream and tell me that I will never be able to make an income supporting myself through gym ownership. They're pushing me towards higher education and continuing college. I'm 31 years old and currently working as a veterinary tech and a CrossFit coach neither pays the bills very well. How do I work through my hesitation to just go for it? I have parents, I have my parents' voice in my head telling me that I'm bound to fail. Even though in my heart of hearts, I know that I can't fail. I can only win or learn oh man cat i'm that's it's one of the things that i i think was one of the the greatest gifts i was given growing up was just the support of my parents it's it's probably why i'm an entrepreneur yep. because they were like go for it for every turn i ever went down they were like go like and even if they had their doubts, and they, my dad's told me since now that he did have his doubts. He's like, what are you doing? <laughs> You're going to leave a job at, you know, yeah. doing derivatives and foreign exchange at State Street Bank to go be a personal trainer. He just had this vision of this 45-year-old, which is so funny because that's how old I am now, 45-year-old personal trainer. And, yeah. And, and, but he never showed it. And that, 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 meant, a, that meant a lot. So, Kat, uh, all the sympathies because that's a hard place to be. It's not your parents' fault. Your parents want more than anything else for you to be comfortable and successful. And they don't, the way to do that is not to take risks. They want you to be safe. Yes, 100%. That's why parents say, go be a lawyer, go be an accountant, go be a doctor, because those are the safe paths. It's the safest path to um, a high paying salary career. Whereas, entrepreneurs are riddled with failures like they're every that's what we see but uh you know great things come with risk otherwise every single person would do it so can you do this i don't know are you going to fail very possibly should you still do it i think you should Mm -hmm. that now don't just go you know, guns a blazing, haphazardly jump off the ship with no life jacket. That's not what this is about. I think you can do this very systematically, much like we had in a recent person that reached out to us. It was a uh, a critical care nurse that wanted to be a firefighter. Like, how do I make that transition? Three years to make three that. years to make that transition. Exactly right. Very systematically took the appropriate steps to mitigate the risk and falling flat on your face. I love that approach. You know, I talk all the time about, you know, doing what sets your heart on fire. That's not like at every whim and every turn and right now, it's do it in the most advantageous, professional, productive way possible. And if that means continue to be a vet and a CrossFit coach while you do this, then yeah, I'm not saying quit both. Go pay first, last security, build a bunch of equipment, and take a, a $250,000 build out to make mm-hmm. this thing a go. But I'm also saying don't don't not do it because your parents don't have your support. They're, you don't need their permission. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're, I think it can be easy to misconstrue the concept of, of hard on fire and think and and forget that in order for that to be the case, you have to first start with a little flame. You've got to start with a little spark and that spark Mm -hmm. over time gets you to a place, hopefully if all things go well, where you're living a life where you feel like your heart's on fire, but it doesn't, you don't light your heart on fire tomorrow because then you've just, you'll burn everything down. Right. You've got to like that a lot. You've got to do it. You've got to do it in such a way. Yeah. You've got to do it in such a way that that fire, that heat grows and builds as you move towards it. And I, we recently talked about, um, 
uh, the Almanac of Naval. Yep, Naval, uh, yep. Uh, Naval, sorry. Um, I believe it's him that says this. It's find something that feels like play to you but looks work. like work to someone else. That's how you know it's something to set. That's setting your heart on fire. And because it feels like play to you and looks like work to somebody else, you're going to win. Because yep. you'll out, quote, work them. Because it's play to you. And that's been kind of my litmus test forever is blur the line between work and play. It's, I say it a different way. Yep. Blur the line between, if it feels like play to you, I like his words better, actually. Mm-hmm. If if it feels like play to you, but it it's actually work, that's a great place to put some effort into. Yep. Yep. Next question. Uh, I don't have a name on this one. It's in the eat category. My partner and I don't have kids yet, but we talk about feeding our future children often already. It's something I stress about and want to make sure we do correctly. I was over-restricted as a child, and he was the opposite and always had snacks. It seems like we both end up having bad eating habits. I'll closet eat, and he buys, and he just buys junk. Any thought on how we can make sure we find the right balance in and for the future? Okay, I'm just gonna, I'll just lay some things out here, and we'll, uh, you can yep. pull on any of them, or we can go, cool. Um, here's the way I would start this. Um, as an infant and a toddler, if you feed your kid crap, I think that you're doing it's child abuse. Mm-hmm. Like they don't have a say in it. If you feed your child sugar and shitty oils, just because I'm getting kind of I never swear, but I'm getting kind of passionate about this. I really believe this. It's like that's a horrible thing for a parent to do. They have no say, in it and they're not even asking for it. You're really setting your child up, and those first couple few years, two three years, are so formative. Like that's where I would start in this is like, you're going to try and make it as clean as you possibly can. Cause why would you not? Mm-hmm. Right. You have full control and they don't want, there's nothing else in there. Now I'm not saying if they won't eat peas to not give them mashed carrots. Like that's not like, it doesn't matter. They're like go with what they want. Yep. Okay. It becomes more challenging when the kids start asking for the crap food and all that. Here's, the way I think about this, and I'm not as passionate because I think there's many ways to kind of like split this mm-hmm. after after that, is I'm of the opinion of not having the junk in the house at all, mm-hmm. but also not restricting on special occasions. That it's kind of it's what they do in Iceland, mm-hmm. and I really like that model a lot. You know, they don't have any junk in the house. It's not a part of their culture. It's not a part of their norm. But they celebrate birthdays with cake. They have candy on certain special occasions. So I think that's phenomenal. Let food be part of that celebration, a part of the ritual routine, um, not part of the norm, yep. the crap food. Yep. And then from there, no restrictions at all on qu- quantity of food. So as much of the burgers, you know, with you know, as much as the um, the cold cuts, as much as the fruits and the vegetables, as much as the oatmeal, as much as the, um, all of the stuff that fits that mold. Yep. They, that's where I would go. That's, that's, that's kind of where I parse that into is those three things mm-hmm. as infants and toddlers, super clean as they get older, not in the house, but not restricted in terms of quantity or special occasions. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts? I uh, agree with that. I found that to be the easiest way to to manage this. Um, this also, also, let me just say also, like, yeah. a special occasion might be once a week during the summer you go out for ice cream. Totally. Yeah. Like, that's, that's a, we and we do that. Yep, so do we. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the one thing that makes me think of, and this was uh, probably about a month ago now because we're into summer now, but at the end of... The end of my oldest son's finishing kindergarten. He didn't, he came home. This happened, this happened enough. We came home and he like, his lunch was gone, except his like, his turkey was still there. And I was like, hey buddy, like you didn't eat your protein. And I, which I talked to him about all the time. And for the first, and I, and this is not the first time I said that, not the first time. And he turned to me and this was the end of the school year. And he said, I'm the only person, I'm the, I'm the only one of my friends who has protein at lunch. And I don't know if he was just like kind of just giving it to me because like I always bug him with yeah. opportunity or if it's actually the case that his friends. But that really like I thought of it when you got a little bit like yeah. passionate about because yeah. I, I had that same moment. I was like, that is that is really sad for your friends. Um, well, go to here. I go to, uh, you know, lacrosse games and soccer yeah. games. And what's on the sidelines during these jamborees and these tournaments? It's goldfish, Welch's fruit snacks, which aren't fruit. 
um, pretzels, Dunkin' Donuts, um, and, and candy. It's 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 horrific. Yeah. It's terrible. And maybe I'm a little bit passionate about it because first I I think kids don't know. Yeah, you can't let the kid have the choice. Like they're gonna go at this and old, but. They're going to jump at every flashy thing that they can because they don't they don't have enough understanding of the choices that they're making. And it's the it's the adults' choice to put them in the right environment. We have to make those choices for them. And people go like, "Well, no, if you don't give them um, the junk all the time, then they're going to go crazy with." It. What are you talking? So like, so it, there's a reason that we don't give our kids cigarettes mm-hmm. all the time but then when they're older they're going to be exposed to cigarettes mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that they're going to go crazy for the cigarettes when they're exposed to the cigarettes they now understand the ch- difference between healthy and unhealthy choices it's the exact opposite of what people say yeah yep. anything specifically for for this person thinking about future kids and kind of dealing with their own stuff before they have kids that they bring into it oh that's a great one um you know, because yeah, I would, I would, she, I would uh, go with the same principles. Yeah, don't have it in the house. Yeah. Get as clean as you can, and don't restrict quantity. Yeah. That. Yeah. yeah, I think what's interesting in this question is just like this idea of, you know, they they both grew up kind of in opposing with opposing philosophies, and they both ended up at the at an extreme that is not a, not good for them, right? She, he or she says, "I'll, I'll closet eat," and he just buys junk. It strikes me that like before they have kids is the time to figure out yeah like cuz if they call. they're great not going to fix it if they don't fix themselves first cuz right. the reason that the kids have it is cuz the parents haven't figured out how to do this for themselves mm-hmm. and if the parents can't do it themselves they can't yeah they can't do it for their kids cuz they're getting the stuff in the house so if the stuff is in the house it's because the parents want it yep. so the first step before you have to worry about the kids the future kids the kids aren't there yet is to just take care of your own yeah take care of your own environment first yeah, and, so, and I would um, encourage somebody that like uh, is doing the binge eating or the um, closet eating, is it? closet eating uh, or the snacking all the time. Was it buying junk? Buying is we've talked about this before, but like try to get the like snack on like fresh pop popcorn, yep. right? Like that type of thing instead of going for the Oreo cookies. So just try to make it uh, make a big big fruit salad and put a thing of yogurt on it with a you know that's like try to switch out for some healthier choices yeah. all right recover bucket i've been doing crossfit for six years and recently got an injury on my or in my s si joint lower back basically it was from a combination of core fatigue twisting movements and deadlifts in one session it's been three to four weeks uh since the injury and i've been seeing a chiro and a physio I still can't do proper back squat, hard to go below below parallel, and some other movements. It's frustrating to see everyone around me improving and working out as normal. How should I think about this? I've been working hard on rehab, but it still takes longer than expected. I'm a bit bit scared to try new movements. Okay. Ooh, so there's a few things in there. A few things in there, yep. Okay. Um, How should I go about thinking this? Been out for three or four weeks. Stinks that everybody's getting better. I don't get to work out. Taking longer than I wanted, and I also have this fear now of... Okay, so this is um, the first like Ben Bergeron answer type thing is it, it, the universe could give two craps about your expectations of how long it's going to take. Like it, it's you got to drop that. I, I, I all that's going to do is cause frustration. Yep. You know, um, happiness is reality minus expectations. And if your expectations are higher than your reality, you're upset. You're mm-hmm. a negative. So you got to kind of like you got to let go of that. Um, the next part is to try to, when you're trying to get back to movement is to try to be doing the movement as much as you can, um, with big underlying bold, uh, in a pain free mm. setting. So I okay, can't get back to back squats yet. Can we air squat? Mm-hmm. Okay. If we can air squat, can we hold the bottom air squat for three or four minutes? That's going to really help open it. A lot of the times the back is giving you issues because of something downstream. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's upstream. Um, sometimes it is right there. It's a slipped or herniated disc or something like this. But SI things is, I'm going to guess, is probably more um, about your hips. Mm. 
Can you use this time to really open up your hips? Can we be spending um, you know, extra time in pigeon poses and open up the hip flexors? So I get it. It's frustrating to watch everyone else keep going while you're sitting on the sidelines. Um, just try to stay not at, I'm going to use proactive in terms of moving yourself down the field, but you have to do it in different ways. You're not going to put 20 pounds on your back squat in the next two months. Mm-hmm. Your goal is to get back to functionality. So how much time are you spending? And going to a PT and going to a Cairo is not the, that's the ads. You got to do this stuff on your own. Mm. So you got to open up your hips. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm saying if that is the, the root cause of it. Right. But figure out what that is and then figure out what the root time. cause is and, and fix it. Got it. Okay. Last question. And, uh, sympathies because I've had back issues and when your back's out, you're out. Yeah. That's what's so hard. Like you, you sprain your ankle, there's still plenty you can do. Yep. You mess up your back and man, it's tough. Last question we've got in our connect bucket is from Carrie. During this year's open, an athlete at the gym was not was clearly not meeting the standard for the strict handstand push-ups. Her head was not touching the ground on any rep. She had a judge. Her judge did not know repper. He counted all 20 no reps as reps, and she was able to get six snatches uh, at 125. Several members watched it happen, and as you can imagine, it was a subject of several quiet conversations. This is my 10th open. I'm a master's athlete. My competitive days are behind me. And so getting caught up in the gym drama or finger pointing, uh, and, so, and so is getting caught up in the gym drama or finger pointing. She'll make quarterfinals but not uh, as a semis athlete. My question, what does it matter? Is it worth embarrassing this member, hurting her pride, questioning her integrity, et cetera, to make her redo the workout? As a coach or gym owner, what conversations would you have, if any, with this athlete or with her judge? I'm just going to rephrase that because there's people that probably don't do CrossFit the Falls have no idea what you just said. Totally. (laughs) Yep, there's lots of... Yeah, lots of jargon and specific stuff in there. Um, Essentially... um, there was a event, a competition where their volunteer judge was tasked with counting um, the amount of perf- to judge a performance. And this judge is not trained. They're not supposed to be trained and they didn't do a very good job. And because of that, there's a lot of drama about like, should her score count? Should we talk to her? And, and so on. So you could relate to a work environment or home environment. Or there's a number of different ways this would pop up. Yeah, this is hard, mm. and I, um, it's a real challenge every time it pops up because this is it happens all the time. Yeah, I should say all the time. All the time is an absolute; it doesn't happen all the time. It happens it happens enough. It happens enough that it's something that we uh, navigate. Yep. And what's the easy thing to do? Let it go. Let it go. Ignore it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. There's a crack in the foundation, <laughs> right? And what happens when you let the next one go? Mm-hmm. Another, Another crack yep. in the foundation. This is you as the leader. It's not this person's job that's asking. Yeah. It's the. But her it, question is like, well, what do you do as yes. the gym owner, as a coach? Yeah. Yeah. You have to have a hard conversation. And you do it with all the empathy in the world. And you do it right after you learn of this. Yep. And it's going up to the athlete and going, oh. Like, Mary, I am so sorry. Um, Bill gave you credit for those reps. Um, That's not the standard that's being required in this workout. In the regular class, of course, like you just go and do those things. That's not, we didn't hit the standards that need to be met in this competition. So you have some choices. You can... Um, you can redo the workout and I'm happy to judge you and I'll talk to Bill too by the way and just let him know so he knows what's going on and I can judge you um, and I'm happy to do that you let me know anytime that you want to come in and we can do this thing together um, or you can kind of go um, no you know what like it doesn't matter that much to me and I'm just not going to submit a score and that's your choice um, and it's up to you Um We had this happen um, with a quarterfinal athlete that was was a semifinal athlete. Mm. And we needed to call it out. And the athlete needed to, and she was visiting. She's not even one of our members, Mm. so even harder, right? 
and she had to redo the workout and she redid the workout that day just hours later. And it's hard. Those events are only like two days. Yeah, you have to submit. You have to submit scores the next 24 hours. So it's it's super challenged, but um, it's on a unique position. But as a leader, you do need to act with integrity and integrity is doing the right thing regardless, regardless how big or small it is. Do you walk past the piece of trash or do you pick it up? Super small, mm-hmm. big. Do you have a hard conversation like this? This is what the job is for us as human beings, let alone business owners, mm-hmm. is to act with integrity. So yeah, you have to you have to take action. And what does it matter? That's the dangerous thing. Mm. What does it matter that I walk past a piece of trash? It's regardless. Yeah. That's the only way to live a life of integrity, regardless. Got it. All right. If you want, if you'd like to get a question in the queue, find me on Instagram, P.S. Cummings. Drop me a DM. I'll get it on there. Ben and I are going to be back in just a minute with our workout. We've got a question from Jeannie about how to prioritize healthy habits. So stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Head to betterhelp.com slash excellence to learn more about how online therapy can be convenient, flexible, and on your schedule. I was just reading in the news the other day that uh, 20, that this is according to Gallup, 23% of U.S. adults visited a mental health professional in 2022, and that is up from 13% in 2004. And you could look at that and you could say, well, that's an indication of things going very badly. <laughs> but I actually choose to look at it as a good thing. I think that there is a conversation happening and an acceptance of the recognition that we don't always have to have all the answers, all of the darn time, that there's a lot of value in asking for help when we need it, that there is a lot of value in getting outside perspective and insight from people who know what they're talking about. And so I see that number, I see that bump up in that number as a good thing. Because I think what it means is that people are no longer hiding behind a stigma and a fear of raising their hand up and saying, you know what, I'm a little bit lost. I'm a little bit stressed. I could use a little bit of help. That is why we are excited to partner with BetterHelp. Whether you're struggling with stress, anxiety, or just need someone to talk to, a licensed therapist is just a few clicks away. Head to BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash excellence. You'll get 10% off your first month. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. All right, we are back. We've got a question from Jeannie. She asks, how do you prioritize healthy habits based on the five factors? Now that I have small kids, work full-time, et cetera, it's simply not possible to do all the things, maintain friendships, be a good mom, meal prep, healthy foods for all of us, exercise, journal, meditate, sleep, et cetera. So for seasons like this, where do we focus or how do we focus our, on our overall health or uh, and to, quote unquote, push off the nursing home? Cool. Um, okay, so first, the five factors, which if, if you're new, because we talk about all the time, we just listen about three or four times, um, but it's how you um, eat, sleep, train, think, and connect with other people. And sleep, you can also add recovery stuff in, as, as a, bigger, a bigger category if yep. we want to expand it. Yep. So the question is, I'm busy, like I, you know, like everybody is, and I, you know, I'm a mom, and I drive, and I work, and I have to do the laundry and the dishes and all the all the other things. How do I still have time to meditate and journal and breathe and do um, exercise and all of these things, mm-hmm. and sleep nine hours a day? And <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, here is the way, if the question is, how do I prioritize it? Here's the way I would figure out how to prioritize it. Let's, and we talked about this re- very recently in a, a, a couple in, weeks ago. Yeah. yeah which is why I want to yeah. keep it going. Cause I cool. want to, I want to dive deeper. Let's, I, I, it's really powerful for us all to understand this framework. Really? This is where we start the, the, the conversation off every single day. You intro this show with creating the frameworks that most mm-hmm. positively affect our lives and make sure we're chasing the right thing. So here is our framework for health. We have these five factors. You have a bell shaped curve on the left-hand side. You have sickness at the top. You have wellness on the right-hand side. You have fitness. What we need to be able to do is make sure <clears throat> we're at least well in all of the five categories. Mm-hmm. We don't need to get to fitness. Let me say it again. 
We need to make sure we're not sick in any one of these five categories. You need to be well in all of them. You don't need to be fit in any of them. Okay. So what we need to do is identify what are the top level behaviors for each of these. So what's the driving first principle? So let's go through each of these very quickly and we can dive down some quicker rabbit holes if we want to. Eat. On the left-hand side of that spectrum, sickness, it's ultra processed. Mm -hmm. The well is processed and the right-hand side is clean. So map where you are. Where are 80% of your calories coming from? Mm -hmm. That's an 80-20 principle, right? Like we, we don't need to be perfect or anything. Where are 80% of your calories coming from? Are they coming from ultra-processed foods? Which, by the way, if you're eating them, they're so calorie-dense. It's not the weight, it's calories. So mm -hmm. if you're having a donut, that's going to be like 600 calories, meaning as opposed to um, you having a donut and then you having a carton of blueberries is not a one-for-one. -one. That's like a five for the donuts and a one for the blueberries. Mm -hmm. You're getting the majority of your calories from processed foods. So when you're, you're saying 80% of your calories, 80% of your coming? calories, where are they coming from? Yep. It's that simple. Are they coming from ultra processed? Are they coming from processed? Let's define that really quick. Process being um, cold cuts. You're eating uh, um, vegetables and fish when you go out to eat mm -hmm. because that their the restaurant is processing that. They're cooking in oils and it's all those. Um, it's uh, eating whole wheat bread. It's um, so if you're eating sandwiches and Greek yogurt and um, fruits and vegetables, you're eating processed foods essentially. Clean processed, just to be clear, processed is really anything that a human touches at some point, yeah, right? So, much. like, I've talked to EC about this. Like, she would to be something that like is quote unquote organic or or ultra clean. It like literally like it, it was picked and you ate it. Yes, and very few things are that because we just live in. And that's what's on that other side. Exactly, that's the yeah. ultra clean. So, where are you on that spectrum? And it's okay to be processed. Yeah, that's what that, that's yes. my point. Is that there are things that you and I would be like, yes, go for. Yes, and we would also be able. We would Honestly, like, also call that. Let's processed. say. Let's say you go to here's here's mm. you go to Sweet Greens for lunch. You have uh, um, a. a a sand or the next day you have a sandwich for lunch. The next day you have, you get it right. It's like the things that process doesn't mean the devil. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the eat. Then we go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Really simple. Are you sleeping five hours? You're sick. You're sleeping seven hours. You're well. You're sleeping nine hours. You're good. Okay. Yeah. Move, eat, sleep, train, uh, train, move, whatever we want to call that one. Um, if you're sedentary, sick. If you exercise in air quotes, mm -hmm. right? That's the government recommendations of three times a week, 30 minutes of cardiovascular exercise, right? So do you jog? Do you do some yoga? Do the Pilates? That type of stuff. Like you're, you're not only are you walking around during your life, but you're actually seeking out some quote exercise. Mm -hmm. you, um, you do a spin class, that type of thing. Or on the far side, you train. This is you are identifying your strengths and weaknesses across the 10 components of fitness and making sure you're trying to eliminate those things in a systematic fashion with goals attached to them. Mm -hmm. That's training. Very, very different than I'm going to go to a spin class four times a week. That's exercise. I'm going to go to that aerobics class. I'm going to do my, you, you get it. Yeah, we cross with being like a, going. If to you're CrossFit in CrossFit, yep. if you're in CrossFit and you're doing the, the CrossFit prescription, yep. if you're doing CrossFit five to six times a week, you're training. Got it. Because by by default, you're getting exposures to your weaknesses. Yep. What is if you jog for three mi three mile jog three times a week? That's exercise. Mm -hmm. Even if you're training for a marathon, that's exercise. Because mm -hmm. we need to make sure we're filling the gaps in the ten components. Really quickly, just so we know what those are. Um, cardiovascular endurance, strength, stamina, flexibility, speed, power, uh, coordination, balance, accuracy, and agility. So we have, of those things, what's the lowest thing? We're going to move our thing, it. move okay. it up there. That, that's a good distinction. That's training. You're right. And you're right. By default, CrossFit. You're going to get by those. training. Yep. yep. That's why we love this program. Yep. Exactly. Okay. Um, now we have eat, sleep, move. Think mm -hmm. you're sick if you have a victim mindset. You're doing just fine if you're an optimist, like totally fine. You are, um, you have mental fitness if you have a warrior mindset. 
just to give some people constructs for that. Victim, woe is me. The world's out to get to me. Not my fault. Nothing I can do about it anyway. So I'm just going to sit here and pout and live in my misery. Optimist. Future's going to be bright in the past. It's okay, guys. We're going to be just fine. Like, it's going to be great. Like, I love life. Like, that's cool. Warrior. Like, I want, not only can I, not only can I handle any challenges that's thrown at me, I want challenges. Mm-hmm. Bring them on because I know I'm going to evolve through those challenges. We have that prism now. The last one is connect. Connect is a funny one because it's uh, not only is it relationships, which we always talk about, but there is this other thing of like, you have to connect with nature as well, but let's just keep it with relationships for now. Um, Are the relationships you have in your life toxic? If they are, you're on the sick side. Do you have friends and acquaintances? Well, do you have people that you, um, you care deeply about and they care deeply about you? Then you're on the, the fitness side of that deep, meaningful relationships that you're sharing. I'll give some parameters around that one because I think people understand toxic. They understand friends, acquaintances. The other ones, I call it like toxic friend lovers, right? And lovers doesn't mean needs to be romantic, but, pe- but love. Um, people that you can share, you can be vulnerable with. Mm-hmm. Share your hopes, your dreams, and your fears. Um, it's more than small talk. It's you're talking about meaningful things. And we talked about this in a recent one as well. If you could hug that person for five seconds and it not feel weird for either one of you, um, then you're probably on that side of that thing. So now that we have the spectrum. Think about this. If you are, let's, if you are eating um, sandwich cold cuts on whole wheat and when you go out to a restaurant, you order uh, a piece of fish and the veggies and for breakfast, you're having eggs, um, a piece of whole wheat toast, um, And so that's, that's how you're eating and you're sleeping seven hours a night and you're doing some exercise and you're an optimist and you have lots of friends and acquaintances. We're doing just fine. You don't need to be any farther on that side, but if any one of those, this is how you prioritize. And so we're getting back to her question. If any one of those things are not on that, Mm -hmm. they're closer to the six side. That's the one you got to pull up Mm -hmm. and recognize what I didn't, I didn't say anything in there about cold plunging, about journaling, about meditation, about any of these new hot trends, which are distracting us from the core fundamentals of health. Mm -hmm. Do, Do those things belong in a conversation? Yes, but they are when we're trying to move from way beyond well to fit. Mm -hmm. If you never cold plunged, if you never journaled, if you never read scripture, if you never meditated, but you did all those other five factors, you're going to be healthy. Those other things are extra tools that you can use, but they're not necessities. Those should not be in the repertoire if you're they're omitting time for other things that are causing you to potentially be sick. Mm-hmm. So EC has this great phrase of of majoring in the minors, and one of quite frankly, like the the podcast she and I do together, is often just pointing at where people are focusing on the minors instead of the majors, and and. Um, you touched on what a lot of those majors are, but I bring that up and and you sort of alluded to some of them, whether, you know, whether it's cold exposure, whether it's um, um, meditation, breath work. Which, by the way, I do all those things. Totally, yeah. And they I'm not, all are beneficial. None of them will make up for anything on the yes. sick side of another category. Yes. And so that's what, that's why I bring all those up is to say, like, how do we make sure that we're not distracted and that we're not majoring in the minors when so much of the noise around health and fitness is on on some level somebody trying to tell you that the minors are are the majors yeah. let's pu- let's pull out some of these specifics this is what people want the conversation to be i'm going to say i should say industry wants doesn't want us to understand this mm-hmm. because there is a whole boatload of, okay, so bash me if we want to, Ben's a conspiracy theorist, whatever you want to say. There's a whole bunch of potential profit to be made when people are on the sick side. And 
processed foods are way more profitable than, as you said, somebody picking something out of their garden in their backyard. <laughs> like, it's just that. There's a whole lot more to be made through the healthcare system with sick people and there's health people. So this is what they want us to do is to get distracted by all the... So you'll have a conversation about not eating processed foods and you'll talk about chicken and you'll say like, you know, and I... I make it really easy. I just throw the chicken in the air fryer and they'll go, you know what I heard about the air fryer? Mm -hmm. The air fryer is, and now we're just, now we're off of the topic of, it's not about the air fryer. It's about moving from the ultra processed to processed and from processed to clean. That's the conversation. The big conversation now is like, is, is cooking on a gas burner Mm. healthy or not? Mm. And if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're cooking on charcoal grills, is that, Good or bad, and this it's it's every and that what they're doing a phenomenal job of distracting us away from the real conversation. Like, are you eating chicken or are you eating crap? Mm -hmm. Like that's what it is, and we can talk all no, but like the chickens are fed this, this, and this. Like, I agree, but that's the conversation from well to fit. Let's talk about like let's make sure we're talking about this in the context of what we're talking about. It's. A matter of, um, you know, we talked about this recently about like the, 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 one of the lead people of the Obama administration mm-hmm. saying that it's not about the food Biden, that you eat. Biden administration. Biden administration. What did I say? Not, you said Obama. Obama. Oh my God. <laughs> Biden administration. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, Dr. Stanford of, it's weird, Dr. Stanford yeah, of totally Harvard. Confusing. Very yeah. confusing. Um, she's a, a professor at Harvard. Um, and she got, and she was on 60 Minutes. You can look it up. It's, look at, it, I watched this live and we went through our gym. Our gym went bonkers because mm. our gym's educated enough to understand that she, this is ridiculous. What she's saying is that the the food that you eat, the quality of the quantity of the food that you eat has nothing to do with your weight. Mm. She's distracting us. Like she's distracting us away from the real conversation, which is, are you eating ultra processed, processed or clean? That's. Like, we don't need to have another conversation about food. Okay, is it about vegan or carnivore? Is it about intermittent fasting or macros? Is it about keto or is it about the Hollywood cookie diet? Like, let's just start at, the, like, start at this thing. It's this simple. Health is simple. Are you eating relatively clean? Are you sleeping seven hours do you have friends and acquaintances do you exercise and do you have at least an optimistic mindset Mm -hmm. full stop we're done if any of those things aren't in place work that one up Mm -hmm. and then if you want to chase some cool things on the other side like i know i want to eat organic and i want to count my macros and i want to try intermittent fasting and i want to cool let's go do that thing i want to try to compete for the CrossFit games. I want to run a marathon. I want to, cool, let's go do those things. I'm interested in the chili pad and the sleep eight. And I'm interested in um, taking some supplements to help me sleep. Cool, let's go do those things. But not at the expense of the other stuff. Because the, because when we look at them as the solve for the hard work of getting from the sickness to the wellness, right? When we look at something to say, well, instead of doing the hard work of cooking my own food, I'll do, I'll take that supplement instead. Cause that seem that's easier, right? Instead of whatever, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is. The, the answer is always to go back to the difficult and do that and focus on that and not let yourself get distracted. Yeah, I might by... change difficult to fundamental, like foundational. Sure. It's it, To me, it's like the foundation, because I don't want to say it's easier to move from processed to ultra clean. That's not mm-hmm. easy. That's you growing a garden in your backyard. Mm-hmm. That's crazy hard and difficult and challenging. The idea is, um, you know, the question started with how do we prioritize? Yep. Mm-hmm. And we have to figure out which of the ones that's it's you're only as strong your own as your weakest link. So it's not about getting from ten to twenty pull ups if you're only sleeping four hours a night. Mm-hmm. It's about improving that one because you already got ten pull ups. Like you're probably doing pretty darn good job. I think that as we understand 
the different factors, five of them that truly influence, and by the way, these are behaviorals, mm-hmm. when I say factors, the things that you can take control of. Are there other things? Absolutely. There's toxins in the air and there's your DNA. Those things matter. I'm not saying they don't at all. But these are behavior. This is what you do on a daily basis. You don't do anything on a daily basis for your DNA. Maybe that's going to come down the yeah. pipeline in five to ten years, but yep. they're working on it. Yep. But right now, there's nothing you can do that's accessible to the masses the way that these other five are. Okay, so circling back to Jeannie's question, just to put a put a little bow on it. She says, uh, it's simply not possible to do all the things. She listed some of the things, right? Uh, but journal, let's listen. What are, yeah, journal. Um, good. Yeah, meal prep, healthy food, exercise, journal, meditate, sleep enough, et cetera. So your prescription or what we've been laying out here is – Chart where you're at across each five of these across that spectrum from sickness, wellness to fitness. Identify where you are not in the middle of that or to the right of that spectrum, right? The wellness to the fitness end. And that's where that's where you spend the time. That's where you prioritize. Yeah, because if you don't do that, Jeannie goes like, well, I, I, you know, I I need there's so much more I can do on the fitness side. Like I could be also okay. running. Okay. Yes. I could also be swimming. I could also do yoga. I could also, and what we're doing there is we're continuing to just pour more things yep. into the singular factor. Yep. And it's not so if she's, if so she's if mentally. So I want, so I'm going to, um, I'm going to meditate. Yep. I'm going to journal. I'm going to read scripture. I'm going to find stillness. I'm going to go and do a silent retreat. Those are all in the same factor. Right. Those are in the same bucket. Yep. And what happens is, yeah, you become this monk but has no physical capacity right and it's like there's actually the story the, the monks would get up at 3 30 in the morning so they're diving so far into the think category but they're missing the sleep mm-hmm. we don't want that we want it across all of them this is how we do it and this is how you prioritize it and that's, you don't yeah we don't need to continue to ice plunge sauna workout yoga and all those things. those are all in the same bucket mm-hmm the, it's important, I think, and I think it's a good place to wrap up. Is the is the balance across the five yes. is what we're aiming for. Yes, that is our definition of health. That is our definition of healthy, not a little bit fitter, not eat a little bit cleaner, at the expense of the other things. It is remembering what we are aiming for, and then measuring ourselves against that goal, that aspiration, and not getting distracted by five more pull ups. If the five more pull ups takes away from uh, you know, more sleep. Right. How many people do we know that are these type A go getters that go to the gym every single day, eat super clean, kill it at work, but have crappy relationships at home and don't sleep? Yep. And they're like, I got to get fitter. Yep. I got to get healthier. So what do they do? They eat cleaner and go to the gym more. Yep. <laughs> yep. All right. Cool. Thank you, Jeannie. Hopefully that, that was helpful. Uh, ben and I, we're going to be back in just a minute with a shout out and a new cool down. We're going to talk about your top 10 CrossFit Games coaching moments. So stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by a new sponsor, Life Force. Click the link in the show notes to learn more about how Life Force can help you take control of your health and optimize your performance. Life Force is a health optimization company providing you with the tools and support you need to help you reach your health goals. Their membership combines diagnostic testing, functional medicine doctors, certified health coaches, and advanced nutraceutical and hormone therapies to help you look, feel, and function at your peak. Here's how it works. Starting with an at-home blood draw to test 40-plus biomarkers, LifeForce creates a personalized proactive health plan that includes the exact recommendations tailored to each member's individual biology and goals. As a Life Force member, you'll get a personalized plan written by a certified clinician and the opportunity to schedule a free telehealth appointment to talk through your results and what you can do to optimize your health and level up your life. That's not all. Life Force memberships include continuous performance tracking, a plan that's one of one, and expert clinical support. Every three months, Life Force will draw your blood to see where you're performing well and what needs work based on 40 plus biomarkers that drive your mental and physical health all from the comfort of your home. From that data, they create your personalized plan, including advanced nutraceuticals, lifestyle recommendations, and hormone therapy to help you get back in balance. And with ultra-personalized care from their team of experienced functional medicine doctors and certified health coaches, you'll have the support and accountability you need to succeed. Do not settle for average. Take control of your health with a life force. 
Start your membership today and receive $200 off. Learn more at mylifeforce.com. That's M-Y-L-I-F-E-F-O-R-C-E.com. That $200 off needs to come through the link in the show notes. So make sure you clickety clicky that. We're brought to you this week by the smart people at OneSkin. Head to oneskin.co to learn about how to get healthier, better looking skin and use the code excellence to get 15% off your purchase. OneSkin has developed a revolutionary approach to skincare by focusing on improving skin function rather than just its appearance. They believe that skin health is essential to overall well being as it is the largest organ in the body and plays a crucial role in whole body health. From protecting against external pathogens to regulating body temperature, skin health is so much more than skin deep. OneSkin was founded by a team of four female PhD-level longevity scientists with over 15 years of experience studying the biology of aging. After testing thousands of peptides, they discovered OS1, the first peptide proven to reduce the accumulation of senescent cells in the skin. By reducing senescent burden, the OS1 peptide improves skin health at the molecular level, supporting optimal skin function to promote whole body wellness. OneSkin's topical supplements, OS1 face and OS1 body, are formulated to support the skin's natural barrier function, which is essential in its protection and regulation functions. In a 12-week clinical study, OS1 face improved skin's barrier function by an average of 15%. Join OneSkin in thinking differently about the body's largest organ and take an important step in supporting the longevity of your entire being. Get 15% off with the code excellence at oneskin.co. That's 15% off, oneskin.co. Use the code excellence. We only have one body, one skin, and only you can choose to make it better. All right, we're back. We've got a shout out. This is when we just take a a minute to read a YouTube comment, a note that Ben and I have received, or in this case, a review on Apple uh, Apple Podcasts. This is from B Flint Fitness. He says, I moved from Boston to rural Vermont uh, during 2020 and went uh, went out on my own as a personal trainer. Your podcast helped me keep a positive, healthy mindset through the hardest transition of my life. I achieved my original definition of what success would be in my small town in the first year in the pursuit of chasing excellence. uh, Naturally, the goals have changed and supersede the original. The wisdom, perspective, and general guidance you give extends beyond fitness, and I can't thank you enough for helping me change my life for the better. Thank you. Shout out to B. Flint Fitness, possibly still in Vermont. All right, our cool down. You recently, um, as we've talked about, as you've been talking about quite a bit over the last month or so, uh, this is going to be your last year as a individual coach at the CrossFit Games, CrossFit a coach of individual athletes at the you CrossFit right. Games. I said it right. It's close enough. Um, and you posted uh, on Instagram your top 10 uh, CrossFit Games coaching moments. So I just thought it'd be fun to cool. go through them quickly and give us a kind of a hot take um, on why th- maybe th- this particular memory bubbled up as you started thinking about these. So we're going to go 10 up to number one. Number 10, 2014, Michelle Latondra's readiness for all tests that led to a notable fourth place overall finish, helping give me the confidence that I could coach high-level individual athletes. I think a lot of people forget that you work with Michelle. Yeah. Uh, so 2014, before that, I was... Um, Let me just forget that last Prior one. to that, I'd worked with individual athletes, but it was Chris Spieler and my wife... Um, Chris, I never got Chris the results I was hoping to get Chris. Um, that was when the sport was really getting different and somebody that weighed 130 pounds had, had a really hard time. Yeah. Um, so, and my wife, it's training my wife, so it doesn't really count, but I had lots of success with team athletes, um, multiple podium finishes and we won the CrossFit games. So I would yet to kind of do it with an individual. Um, Michelle got fourth place that year and I, uh, was felt so prepared. So it was a real moment of like confidence that I could do this on the individual side. 2020 Catherine crushing the unexpected challenges of the unknown trail run at the ranch during the COVID games. Yeah. So this is, uh, anybody as a CrossFit fan knows this one, but if you, it's, um, during the COVID games, there was no fans and they took the athletes to this, uh, ranch in, um, California and had the athletes run a three mile loop. When they got to the finish line, uh, Dave Castro, the director of the game mm-hmm. said, you're not finished. You got to go back and run this in reverse order. So they all had sprinted to the finish line thinking yeah. they were done yeah. and they had to go back. 
um, Katrin crossed the the what they thought was the finish line in last place. Yeah. And she went from last, handled it. So well, it's one of the things that we worked a lot on was dealing with adversity and the unknown. She went from worst to first mm-hmm. in the second loop. She went from last to first place. Mm-hmm. So that was pretty dope. I'm an outlier. I, I happen to think that the, the 2020 games, that's one of my favorites. The, the five on five, I think it was really cool. Um, 2013, number eight, filled with pride uh, as team CrossFit New England, the best team I've ever coached, secured a second place finish at uh, the CrossFit Games. Remind me who was on that team. Uh, so that is- I know you posted a picture of it, but I- Yep. But. So that is Derek, who's yep. one of my best friends now. Um, Kevin Mon- uh, Montoya. Montoya. Hold on, I have the picture. And still. James Hobart. And then the girls are my wife, Heather, yep. Rachel Martinez, and uh, Bethany, who ended up Bethany, uh, Jerry, Gary, um, I am not, I'm not good with G's and J's, <laughs> G-E-R-R-Y, who was also an Olympian mm-hmm. um, for bobsled. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it wasn't our best finish ever. We won the CrossFit Games, but this was a second place finish. And the team just, je- it was one of those, so coaching teams is really hard. Yeah, It's really, really hard. But this team was awesome. Yep. It was just like the right mix of people, low drama, high um, camaraderie. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. Really cool. I remember that year. That was fun. Uh, number seven, 2009, coaching Heather and Team CFNE at our first CrossFit Games. So it has to be on the list, right? The first time you ever go there. So this was an Aromas before the CrossFit Games are the games that we know now. And it was just a few hundred people. Uh, but our first time there, we'd only been in our uh, doing this full time for a few months. And... Uh, Heather and uh, the team both finished in the top 20. And we were like, oh my God, we've only done this for a little bit. Like we could actually do this thing. And mm-hmm. um, I also, we also stayed on a beach with the team mm-hmm. in a condo. And it was like so fun to like, we're this weird underground thing that we're doing. And I proposed to Heather right after those games. So it was like very n- nostalgic. That's very funny. That may have been where I met you. Really? Possible. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. It's it's highly possible. I remember interviewing you there because I was I was. I must have met you before because I knew John Gilson way before that okay, because that uh, John was coming to Nobles uh, when we ran this thing part time. Different story, but I, it was it was close to them. Next one, number six, Big Bry, twenty ten. Uh, Brian, uh, Big Bry Curley, my first personal training client ever, winning the first ever Masters Championship in CrossFit Games history. Super dope, yeah. right? So there's a lot like, of firsts is, in there. It's really this cool. is wild. So. Yeah. Li- like I decided I'm going to be a personal trainer. Didn't my mom yeah. is friends with actually not even meets yep. his wife yep. mm. shortly before father's day. And she's like, my son's a personal trainer. And she's like, my husband needs to get in shape <laughs> and bought a gift card for three, yeah. three sessions right yeah. then. And He's literally like, I knocked on his door. He's the first person I've ever, ever, ever worked with. No dry runs, no practices, no friends and family. Literally the first client I ever had. And then uh, six years later, he wins the CrossFit Games. And he's still a client now. He's been in the Games a good zillion times and uh, still a really good friend. Um, That was amazing. Yep, that was a cool memory too. 2020, back to 2020, Katrin and Sam's impressive silver medal performance at the COVID Games. Yeah, so 2020, we had second place finish on the male and female side. There's only 10 athletes there total. You said it was your favorite. And we had three of the top 10. Brooke Wells was the other one, which is a really cool kind of like, it was a lot. Like Mm -hmm. three of the top 10 athletes were our athletes um, and two finished in second place. It was like a really cool, and lost to Tia and Matt, who was like, (laughs) right. (laughs) <laughs> so we, they won the CrossFit Games because yeah. it's like they, <laughs> they didn't count. The other two don't count. Yes. What's interesting is I hadn't thought about this, but 2009 and 2020, like those are one because it was the first one in Aromas for me, and the other one just because I thought it was uh, just more interesting. Both of those were at Aromas. I think there's something about that place for that, sure. That intro, the way that that Dave uses that place as a character in the games to me, it was always the thing about that place that made it so interesting. So I was on a podcast recently and. I, or maybe I wasn't, I can't remember what I was talking about this, but I am a sucker for the, it's, to me, it's all about the offsite events. Yeah. It's the offsite events or what makes the games. Coffee pods and walls. Yes, exactly yeah. that. Yep. It, it's all about, cause the other ones like you're confined. You, like if you're not confined, it's, 
it, it's status quo, right? It's what's expected. And you can make it as there's only a little bit interesting of interesting as can you can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But when you go off site, sky's the limit. Mm-hmm. And like we, they've done some amazing offsite stuff, right? From Camp Pendleton to the Pacific Ocean to Microwave Mountain to flying in a plane to go back to Aromas to using the 7K trail run to like, it's, I, I couldn't agree more with you. And that's what makes Aromas because the whole thing is offsite. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the <laughs> entire is, event is offsite. Onsite. There is yes. nothing. Yeah. So it's really cool. Yeah. Uh, next one, number four, witnessing my athletes embody the spirit of the games, Catherine in 2020, Cole in 2018, Becca Voigt in 2014 and Spieler in 2010. Yeah. I think it's really cool that, you know, there's, I've been doing this for 15 years and four or five of them win the spirit of the games. And, um, I, I it's just, a, it's a proud thing mm-hmm. that I, I, you know, I'm a big believer in building people as well as athletes and better people make better athletes. So for that to be recognized across the community and in that competitive setting is, is neat. <laughs> Number three from 2011, the excitement of the final test announcement, announcement, a relay of girls workouts with CFNE winning affiliate club title. I just, that's, that was a good, that was fun too. I remember okay. uh, Matt Frankel doing Karen, Karen at the end. Yeah. yeah. But go ahead. Give the okay. whole story. So here's, um, we're in, Remember you up there yelling at him. You're like, we're, you're right there. <laughs> we're in second place going into the final event. And um, they do the athlete briefing and it was different then. Like you didn't have to show up at it, <laughs> which is kind of weird. That is weird. But I went to, so the, all the athletes, they do it Sunday morning and it was really early. And I was like, you guys sleep, you guys get your sleep, I'll go there. And Dave Castro announces it and it's a relay. So the first person does... Um, Are you gonna Elizabeth? Remember this? Oh yeah, I'm first impressed. person does yeah. the first girl does Elizabeth, yep. which is twenty one fifty nine power cleans and ring dips. Tag next person does Fran twenty one fifty nine of thrusters and pull ups. Tag next girl does Isabel. Tag next person does Grace. Tag next person does Diane. Tag next person does um, Karen, mm-hmm. which is one hundred fifty wall balls. Um, they announce it, and I. I'm sitting in the stands. I go, we're winning the CrossFit Games. <laughs> We'd practiced that. Like th- we practiced literally this scenario yeah. like three times yeah. at Lisa Mickelson's house mm. where we went. But the way we did it was different. Yeah. I did You had to figure out on the fly. Mm. I went, here's your six events. Who's doing what? Three, two, one, go. And they'd be like, you go do this. And like, it'd be like, okay, now it's this. And you go do it. And when they announced it, we knew how good each of those athletes were at each of those. Mm-hmm. When Lisa got done with Elizabeth, which is the first one, she tagged Mel with like a three minute lead. And she did Fran, right? And she did Fran. Yeah. Man, it, Mel which, extended like, that by another what, yeah. 40 seconds. Yeah. And then we held we held course with Sonia doing um, Isabel. Isabel yeah. mm-hmm. We held course with um, uh, Derek doing grace. And then James was good at handstand pushups and Diane. And then Matt was like, we won it. It was like a runaway mm-hmm. and it was just really, really cool. That was cool. I love the fact of like sitting in the stands, be like, yeah. we've done this we're ready for and that. we're going to like, we, I, I actually, I called them and I was like, cause they were up, but they just weren't here. We we're staying 20 minutes away. I was like, yeah. we're going to win this. <laughs> Really cool. <laughs> That's cool. 2016, my favorite games to date, traveling to Aromas, enduring a uh, demanding trail run, yeah. conquering Murph, braving the Pacific swells, uh, mastering pegboards, ring handstand pushups with Katrin and Matt emerging as games champion. That was a good year. So twofold is like, uh, I had the guy and girl champion. So that's amazing. But it's also, to me, it was the most epic test of the whole thing. It was just everything from the opening night. We have the athletes all have a dinner the night before. And usually they find out what a event or some events or something else like that. And instead the announcement was Dave Castro got up at the end of dinner and said, you will find out your first, uh, he's uh, something along the lines. It's not, you will find out, but like, um, the first workouts will, not be announced, but be here at 3.30 in the morning with your IDs and a change of clothes. Mm-hmm. Have a good night. Mm-hmm. And it was like, what? 
<laughs> it was like, yeah. it's just shot, like, which I love. It's like the chaos of the unknown. And then he still got the next morning, showed up, no coaches allowed, nobody, just them and their ID and a change of clothes. They get on a bus, still no one knows. They go to LAX, the airport, still no one knows. Till they get on a plane, they realize they're going to Santa Cruz. Then they all, people all pieced it together. Mm -hmm. They end up there, no fans, no coaches, three awesome, amazing events, yep. then fly back at night. But before they were to fly back, flight was delayed. Yep. Love the adversity, <laughs> love the challenge. People are freaking out yep. and they have to be at the beach the next morning at 7 a.m. So what a way to kick it off. Yep. It's like, I love that. Yep. That was a good game. I, I, plus Murph, plus yeah. double DT, plus it's just awesome. Yeah, that Amazing was, that stuff. That was a fun year. I'm pretty sure I was there filming that year. So that was fun to be there. All right, last one. Number one, one we're going to wrap up on. 2015, coaching Catherine through a challenging moment with legless rope climbs, which she navigated successfully and went on to win the games. Okay, so this is like the full circle moment. This is like the the thing for, this is like the, the the hero's journey, right? Um, Katrin doesn't make the games for, uh, Katrin makes the games for two years, finishes in 20 something place for two years in a row, middle of the road athlete. Um, the next year she fails to make the games because of legless rope climbs. Moves to Boston. We work together. We work on rope climbs and a bunch of mindset stuff. We work on rope climbs and a bunch of, <coughs> We work on rope climbs and a bunch of mindset stuff and try to build her up to be this more formidable athlete. That games, we have no expectations, but halfway through we're in, she's in first place. Mm -hmm. She's wearing the leader's Jersey and they announce the event, which is going to have legless rope climbs in it. So right away she gets pulled. She's triggered mm. as we're talking about and she's freaking out. And literally, I'm having a conversation where they're like this, this far. Um, Angel, who's the director of athletes, walks over and hands Katrin the <laughs> white leader's jersey, yep. said, congratulations, you're in first place. Mm -hmm. Katrin lost it. Mm -hmm. Like, everyone's going to be watching me. This is my epic fail. By the way, she was in first place at the regional when she lost. Like, So this is like the same exactly. thing happening yeah, but again. But bigger. But bigger and louder. and Way yeah. bigger, right? <laughs> yeah. Way bigger. So... It was the ability to kind of like coach her through that moment and her come out the other side, which is such an amazing story in of itself. Mm -hmm. um, the way that she reacted. I was, basically what happened was, I was like, this is you and me in the gym. Mm -hmm. You're not on the soccer stadium. You're not at the CrossFit Games. Let's, you're here with me in the gym. I just need you to climb one rope, one legless rope climb. Can you do that? And she said, yeah, of course I can. I was like, phenomenal. If you climb that one rope, what I want you to do is when you're done, just sit there until I would tell you you're ready to go back up. Mm -hmm. Can you do that? And she's like, of course I could do that. Yeah, yes, I can do that. I was like, if you do that, we win. Mm -hmm. And she's like, what? It's like, that's our win. If you can do those two rope climbs, we do that, we win. And she did it. She did her single rope climb, came down, sat, went up, climbed the next one, came back down. And she was like pumped and excited. And then just before the buzzer, she happened to climb up and do a third. Mm -hmm. And she came down. She didn't even finish the workout. She was yeah. capped. Yeah. Came down. Denise Thomas is her judge. She turns to Denise. She's like, oh my God, Denise, I won. Because <laughs> we told her that's the win. She's like, I won. And Denise has like this awkward, weird, like, yeah. I don't know what to do. Yeah, like, yeah. Probably, like, In the first action, she's like, um, I'm sorry, dear. <laughs> uh, but those girls on the finish line, <laughs> they're the ones that won. <laughs> she's like, no, Denise, I won. She's like, okay. And they hug it out and bounce up and down. And 
Uh, and Katrin goes on to win the CrossFit Games for the first time. So that was a really cool moment. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you for that. That was fun. That was, that was a fun trip down memory lane. I remember every single one of those. I was there for a good chunk of them, actually. That's awesome. Um, not obviously with you, but I was, I was close enough to remember all of those things. Um, all right. That's where we're going to wrap it up. That was probably our longest cool down, but that was fun. Uh, thank you, everybody, there for listening. If you would like to get a question into the queue, find me on Instagram. Drop me a DM. P.S. Cummings. I promise you I will get it onto our list and into a future episode. Thank you for your ratings and your reviews. Ben and I will be back next week for another episode of Chasing Excellence.